Time now is 8.20 on Sunday the 10th of September. Sky Dark is happening about three to four minutes earlier each evening, which almost matches the rate at which all the uh, side reel time is drifting towards the west. You're seeing, of course, the Lagoon Nebula. Now it's not exactly sky dark yet, but I thought I'd get a start so we can, uh, because my scope is very close to having to do uh, equatorial flip in order to be able to continue tracking. Uh, none of these studies will be due south, but they're close enough. The key for tonight is I'm leaving the uh, flood rate at 64, but I boosted the sensitivity all the way up to 44.2 um, decibels on the, on the auto gain control, which means the circuits are really being heated up and biased towards the least number of photons needed to cause a change state in the CMOS circuitries. So, this evening I'm expecting the scope to act more like a 15 inch rather than a 12 inch telescope. And I've just now got the signal that I'm going to have to pole flip. Alright, it's now 8.25, five minutes later. I had to park the scope counterweight down and then reinitialize a go to to Messier 8. It's now in the reverse direction that it was. However, we are closer to sky dark, kind of beginning to see the Vegas uh, aspects of the Milky Way overhead. Uh, that usually means we're at about magnitude 4.0 skies, and there are a couple magnitudes uh, fainter in the direction the scope's now pointing, which is about five degrees off from culmination. So here we have at the 15, what I call a 15 inch equivalent, uh, 64 flood with uh, this maxed out bias on the CMOS chips, 44.8 decibels. What I'm looking for tonight is to go a little deeper. I think we can probably add about a half of magnitude to the reach of the scope in terms of being able to see images. But one variable you can never get away from is the sky itself. There were some high thin clouds, but you know what? They very may well have been the same last night. Let's move on to our next study, recapitulating last night's observations for comparison purposes. We've now moved on to the Trifid Nebula, Messier 20. The view looks pretty decent from my angle. Generally speaking, when I'm to the east of the scope, I get a better view of the sky than when I am to the west of the scope. So I'm able to see it both on the Handycam screen and on the Revolution 2 7 inch monitor. So there's our look. I would venture to say it does look a little more present than it did at the 12 inch centers. And all I've done is stayed with the 64 flood and boosted to the highest gain possible, 44.8 from 36, which should add basically a little more than 0.8 magnitudes to the reach of the scope. So let's call it, the scope should achieve 15.8, which means 14.8 magnitude galaxies should be seeable as galaxies with cores and fading to the extremities on the evening. Here we have SA-17, the Swan Nebula, setting it, uh, settling in. I uh, have to turn on the camera briefly every 30 seconds or so, or it'll turn itself off, and I have to flip the lid display open, which reinitiates power, and the result of that, of course, is to disturb the telescope slightly. So that's something I occasionally have to be aware of. So this, again, is our 15-inch view 
on a reasonably decent night of the Swan Nebula. I will be posting up images from both the initial settings, which approximated about a 22-inch telescope, last night's setting, which approximated a 12-inch, and tonight's settings, which will approximate 15. The goal of all of this is to determine the best settings that give both deep sky reach and aesthetically pleasing points of view, because when I start uh, exploring from NGC 1 on again, I'm going to want to have fine-tuned all these parameters to get the best possible view. So there is our swan. And here we have M16, the Eagle Nebula. Probably seeing a little bit more of the nebulosity, even with a little bit of color, than we did with the 12-inch settings last night. But one thing I am now noticing is by pushing the gain so far up, we're getting all kinds of speckling all over the screen, which obviates our ability to do um, the kind of aesthetic imaging that I had hoped to accomplish in this series. I can already tell that perhaps the use of 40 for uh, two on the auto gain control probably is nonsensical. So we're going to stop here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to push to 124 and go to 36, 124 flood or 128 flood and go to 36 uh, gain instead because uh, this, the aesthetic on this isn't good. Now it could be attributed to high thin clouds, so we don't know for sure. But that's an ongoing uh, problem here in the John Day area, that this place creates its own weather by day, especially when it's warm. But I will tell you, I am seeing the eagle spread its wings on the camera, which suggests that maybe something in 15 to 18 inch range of a scope should show the pillars of creation. I'm going to go ahead and switch it over now to new settings. Well, from what I can tell, and it hasn't really had a chance to compile yet, the requisite amount of time, it usually takes about 30 to 40 seconds to get an image presented. At 128, 36 flood, I do believe we reduced the amount of flecking on the screen from overheating. That's what I think is an oversensitivity. And meanwhile, we are seeing the eagle spread its wings. So I'm going to go back and see if I can recapitulate the earlier settings with 128.36 as opposed to 64.44.2. Uh, so we've reduced the amount of bias on the chips that we're exposing for a longer period of time. It seems to give perhaps a slightly superior depth because I'm now figuring we're closer to something like 18 inches in aperture rather than 15. And it looks like the background sky might be slightly better and certainly the eagle's wings are much more apparent with these new settings. Okay, let's hit the image stabilized once again in the lagoon. And clearly to my thinking, this is a better view, but it could be attributed to the fact it's a little later in the evening. It's now almost 8.40 Pacific Standard Time, or Daylight Savings Time. So there's our view of the lagoon. Looks pretty good to me. There's less flecking on the screen, so reducing the AGC to 36 makes sense from the point of view of pure aesthetics. Let's retrace our steps. 
and we'll go on to the, I believe it's the trifid next. Let's let the trifid uh, nebula Messier 20 stabilize on the screen now. Once again, we're now at back to uh, 128 flood, but we reduced the sensitivity from previous 42, which was by standard, to 36, in the hopes that it would enhance the image quality without losing too much in the way of depth. So let's go ahead now on to some other studies. And then it's particularly the Eagle Nebula, I think we're going to get a pretty decent view of that. That disappeared almost completely with the 12 inch settings of 6436. Okay, now we're back to Messier 17, the Swan. We're getting another view of it uh, with at twice the exposure time, but about eight decibels, 36 to 44.2. Yeah, about uh, eight decibels lower, which means we basically got the same amount of reach probably closer to 18 inches, at, uh, 15 inches at this point. Same amount of magnitudinal reach, but we're reducing the amount of flecking and things on the, on the screen, which detracts from the aesthetics. So there's our M17 look at the new settings. Here we go with the Eagle Nebula M16, virtually non-existent on the screen at 64 flood 36 decibels of gain, and quite apparent, although I couldn't tell you whether we can see the pillars of Hercules, uh, pillars of creation, but I do believe I'm seeing them there at 128.36, and effectively all we've added is another 0.8 magnitudes to the reach of the scope. So there's our view of the eagle in flight. Well, now we're at NGC 6888. The scope has done, done an equatorial flip. We're looking almost vertically overhead. I don't think we're losing any aperture quite yet. The view of the crescent is quite good from my angle here. Uh, I'm pleased with this. Now I'm going to have to check against the settings previously in the NGC series because I've captured some of these studies as well. The night is not exceptional. The view of the Crescent Nebula is as good as it gets. We're just basically not pushing the CMOS circuitries quite as hot as they were before. I'm hoping there's less pixelation on the screen and there will be less artifacts because overheating the CMOS circuitry can cause fake stars to appear on the screen as well. Another one of those little space bugs up there. Watch out my ET buddies.
Here's our Dumbbell Nebula, Messier 27. You know what to look for, that 14th magnitude central star. Nice sharp extensions in the hourglass of the dumbbell, and yet some faint extensions making more of a football shape out of it in the 2 to 7 o'clock positions. I'll give it a second while I consult my list for the image to more fully compile. We're about to now launch into other studies that are going to be further towards the east in the NGC 6750 series, beginning with NGC 6772, which I'm hoping is a nice faint galaxy. Not a galaxy. Planetary Nebula NGC 6772. Nice, largest planetary nebula in Aquila. Magnitude 14. A little over an arc minute, kind of egg, eggy shape, 75 by 55 arc seconds in size. The central star is magnitude 18.1, 4,100 light years distant, slightly below the celestial equator, almost 3 degrees, and pretty much culminating to the south. I've got a very good look at this at 42 uh, gain. This is at 36. I think it's comparable. We'll just have to look at the images that I've collected for this series to see if we're getting a better aesthetic view at 36. Pretty pleased with it. Here we go. NGC 6822 is a galaxy in Sagittarius, otherwise known as Barnard's Galaxy. And reviewing my images of this, I found one that faintly suggested the presence of the core of the galaxy in this region. Very distended, egg-shaped like uh, vision. Just barely brighter, mounting towards the center, so the core of the galaxy, which is uh, Magnitude 8.8, .8, but very large, 15.4 by 14.2 arc minutes, and well south, minus 15 degrees, which loses a couple of magnitude right there. Anyway, so what we're hoping to see here is any hint whatsoever of the presence of the core of galaxy NGC 6822. You see 6A35, another galaxy in Sagittarius, magnitude 12.5, almost edge on, 2.4 by 0.7 arc minutes, spiral with a bar, 71 million light years distant, minus 12 degrees declination, and I can definitely make out a wedge shaped galaxy on the screen right there. So, very pleased with that. And as I said, I believe I have screen caps of all of these so we can do comparisons between last night and previous NGC series. Keep in mind, the sky variations, however, can affect the views. NGC 6A36 is a neighbor of 6A35. Magnitude 12.9, 1.7 by 1.5 arc minutes. So more face on, spiral with a bar, 72 million light years distant, minus almost 13 degrees below the celestial equator. I 
do believe we should be able to turn it up on the screen. Here's the previous galaxy. So it should be somewhere in this region here. That's a fuzzy spot. NGC 6857 is a nebula in Cygnus, magnitude 11.4, point eight mark, eight arc minutes. It's got a star associated with it, magnitude 14.3, but it's not a planetary. This is an emission nebula. This may be a cluster in beginning to form in the sky. All that uh, nebulosity will be converted by shockwave into stars in the future. NGC 6871 is a nebula in an open cluster in Cygnus, so this one's a little more further along in forming an open cluster. Magnitude 5.2, 20 arc minutes in size, 15 stars, the brightest of which is magnitude 6.8. It's a class IV3, and you should know what that means. 5100 light years distant, well up in the sky. We may be getting some very slight amount of aperture block on this baby. NGC 6883 is a nebula and open cluster in Cygnus again. Magnitude 8, 15 arc minutes, already formed 30 stars or so. It's a class Roman numeral 1, 3, which means highly condensed, but the stars are fairly disparate in their magnitude 4,500 light years distant. Well overhead, we may be also getting partially blocked with this cluster. NGC 6903 is a galaxy in Capricorn and we know from experience it's right up against that star. Magnitude 11.9, 2.6 by 2.4 arc minutes. It's a lenticular spiral with a bar, so it's a class S, oh, 148 million, 148 million light years distant. Minus 20 degrees, we're probably losing some three magnitudes in terms of reach at this time given its sky position. NGC 6905, Planetary Nebula in Delphinus, magnitude 12, a little less than an arc minute in size, 44 by 38 arc seconds. Central star is magnitude 14, it's 5700 light years distant, and 20 degrees above the celestial equator. We're not losing much more than a half a magnitude on this one. So this is a good view. I have actually turned it up at the 12 inch settings. And as I said, we're probably using 18 inch settings tonight. I have to consult my math and or my chart again. But this is the uh, venture I have before me until the 7150 series of NGCs begins to cycle into a part of the sky that'll give decent views. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take a break and I want to have a look at Bessier 33, the triangular galaxy. Although it is visible on the screen, it does not have much in the way of contrast, and it will make for a nice comparison with previous views, in my estimation. So, take a break, and if the sky clouds over for some reason, I can't continue this observation series, 
carpe noctum. Why, adventitiously, I step forward in the NGC testing something out and the witch's room, NGC 6960 in the Vale Complex popped up and it's approaching culmination. We should be getting a decent view up there. I'm not seeing it on the screen, either screen, but it is, it can be pretty obvious even in a small scope if you have a nebula filter installed. So I'm hoping we're going to get a decent view of it on the manana. So there's our view of NGC 6960. And uh, let's see, maybe I'll skip through a few more and see if I can find more of the Veil Nebula. While 6960 is what is known as the Western Veil Nebula, 6992 is further east, the Eastern Veil. They're pretty much right across from one another. Generally speaking, 6992 gives a more satisfying view, and I'm getting a sense of it on the screen, and both screens actually, and so this one should turn out pretty good. And I may add some snapshots of previous views of it for comparison purposes, but I think this is pretty comparable. All right, I'm gonna follow through on MSCA 33 now. However, it may be behind the roof, and I may have to wait half an hour or so before it will emerge for our final shot. If, if not, carpe noctum. Well, Messier 33 was invisible, but then I realized I might want to follow up on a few other Messiers. This is Messier 71. It's a globular cluster. I'm not going to bother giving the data on it, but that's the view. I have other shots of it. We'll want to do a comparison. Let's push, <coughs> excuse me, We'll push on to Messier 75 next. Here we have Messier 75, small, bright and tight. I'm seeing a halo of resolved stars around it. Those stars weren't quite apparent at 6436 settings. This is 12836 settings and I think it's giving a better view. There was another Messier and I'm going to have to recall what it was that I also wanted to image and it's pretty deep south. I'm thinking it's 56 but I can't be sure about that. Anyway, let me look over my notes. Of course, Messier 56 is in Lyra. It was 55 I was thinking of, but I didn't want to go here because I thought I might end up doing an equatorial flip. That did not happen, and we are getting a pretty decent view of Messier 55, of which I have other images of to compare it to. However, I will point out you are getting the five-pointed star shape. It only comes out with larger apertures. Point to the top, two arms and two legs. So that is very suggestive of a good view. Uh, I'm afraid to tell you folks, I may end up using these values, losing a half a magnitude for the improved aesthetics throughout the rest of the NGC series. I'll make a note of it so everyone will understand we're losing about point, maybe point eight magnitudes in reach. However, if the images are sharper and clearer, we may actually be able to detect a little more features in the brighter galaxies and that would be well worth it.
while waiting on 33. How about a quick look at Messier 110. Not in very good sky position. Off to the north and the east. But at least a decent check. If you can see extensions well beyond the core, not bad. Okay, here we have Messier 33. It's just clearing the eaves. I can't guarantee that we're not getting a little bit of aperture block, but at an angle I can see it's quite present. What I'm going to do now is step through some settings on the screen itself to see if we can't enhance the visibility. I'm going to run the brightness way down on it. Let's see what it does. And we're losing it, aren't we? All right, let's run the brightness up. Way up. A bit overpowering, so I guess leaving it at 50% makes a lot of sense. 42. Here we are. Leave it at 50. Go to our next setting. We'll run the contrast way up. 50%. Highly pixelated. Run it back down to zero. Where it was. And let's check the color out. We'll push it up to 35 or 40 or 50. I may end up leaving it there, although I can see a bit of blue in it. Let's bring it down to 40. I might leave it at 40 for the time being. So, remember initially it was at 30. And I think at one time it had as high as 50. So there's our view of Messier 33. And that is going to be a big carpe marktum.